my mama, you know, but I know you. And uh, so just the fact that she lets you live, okay, is a, a miracle. So Proverbs 31, Proverbs 31. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> we'll read here. Now, this is quite a lengthy chapter. I am going to read the whole chapter, and I have a purpose for it. And instead of doing it responsibly this time, I'll just read and let you follow along. It says, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, What my son and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they forget lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink to him that is ready to perish, and wine uh, unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb and the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. So this mom here is, is giving some critical advice to her son, and now she comes to the part that she spends the most time on, uh, talking about a woman. And I don't know if maybe this king here had him a girlfriend or, or what, but mama steps in and she says, all right, now let me, let me tell you something here. Here's what you need to be looking for. So listen to this. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand she planteth a vineyard she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth, girdle, delivereth girdles uh, unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing. and She shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. You are truly a wonderful, wonderful God. And we're grateful now. Lord, we thank you for mothers. We thank you for, for these ladies, period. Now, Lord, would you help us gain strength, energy, encouragement, learning, understanding from your word. In Christ's name, amen. This woman in Proverbs 31 that King Lemuel's mother described, he de she described it, this lady as completely trustworthy. Always, she always treated people good, always. A hard worker, a wise shopper a good provider, an excellent cook, perfectly selfless, shrewd in business, physically strong, tireless in her work, compassionate in giving, a need meter, an excellent dresser, beautiful, one that contributed to the success of her husband, full of wisdom, a speaker of kind and encouraging words, a thoughtful planner, one that despised laziness, the rightful object of her family's praise, noted for her strength 
and honor and good character. One that feared the Lord. This woman right here, this virtuous woman, she did not just possess some of these qualities. She possessed all of them. Now, I don't know if, like I said, King Lemuel here, maybe he was talking to some girls or something, and Mom, she, she just didn't like any of them because none of them measured up to her little baby. And so she was setting the bar so high here that he would have to find the perfect one possibly. She possessed all of these qualities. Man, what a standard to live up to. My wife can't stand the Proverbs 31 woman. She said, I want to tell you, I want to tell you why I've never been able to find that woman. She doesn't exist. What a standard to live up to. And, and all reality, look, it's, a, it's a, uh, an impossible standard. All right? To live up to these expectations all the time. Now, my mom was a great lady. Uh, she's a good people person, good personality, sense of humor. I mean, she laughs. She laughs with things that aren't even funny. And I'm thinking, mom's lost it. But did she all, I mean, was every word out of her mouth kind and gentle? Not every word. I was telling some people this morning, I got home as a teenager, I, and I, I was there at my curfew. It wasn't that late, but man, her and dad had gone to bed. They were already asleep. And, and uh, so I got home, I, I went in, and I, I took my shoes off, and I'm trying to tiptoe through the house because, look, one thing you didn't do, you, you may cuss or steal something, but you don't wake mama up. All right? And uh, so I, I tiptoed into the to my room, which happened to be right across from their room, closed my door ever so gently, turned my light on, I'm getting ready for bed. Well, I woke mama up. Mama comes and she opens my door. And it was back, let's see, uh, I guess this was in the 80s. She had one in perms. Well, she had already gone to good sleep, and it looked more like a bird's nest, and it was everywhere. She opened that door, and she looked at me, she, she, I mean, wild-eyed. I said, I just kind of looked at her. She said, I could take that lamp and just smash it into the wall. And I said, yes, ma'am. She closed my door, went back to bed, and I thought, what in the world just happened here? So my mom was a good lady, but she wasn't perfect. My wife's a great lady. That's all. We're, we're just leaving it at that, okay? We'll not go any further. I, my mom's three and a half hours away. I'll be seeing her in just a little bit. These are excellent qualities we read of in Proverbs 31. Excellent qualities that er, every lady, and, and be honest, every man probably should strive for. But hitting the mark on every one of them, that's well nigh impossible. You're always going to fall short. Do you ever feel like as a mother that you just fall short? I just, oh, man, I just, man, I'm trying, my, my wife is like, I'm trying to be a good wife. I'm trying to be a good mom. And I said, well, you are. What are you talking about? I feel like I'm failing here. I feel like I'm failing there. And Yeah, but you kiss good, so forget all that. You ever feel like, man, I just, I just can't hit the mark. I have this ideal of, of what I'm supposed to be, what I need to be, what my family expects of me, what society expects of me, what God expects of me, and I just can't seem to live up to those expectations. You ever feel like you've just failed? Let's, let's look at some other moms in the Bible, okay? Turn right quick. We're going to turn to about six different passages here, although I'll read more than that. Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> let's go all the way back here to the first mom. Genesis chapter 3. Her name was Eve. The first mom, the first wife, the first, the first lady uh, of all creation here. Genesis 3 verse 20. Listen to this. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Eve, the first mother. In a sense, we, we all came from Eve. 
hence her title, the mother of all living. Eve was created perfect. No blemishes, no sin, no attitude. She was perfect. Nothing wrong at all. What else was Eve known for? Even though she was perfect, she had not sinned, and, and she was living in a perfect environment, no pressure, no, no real expectations, and yet she is the one who made that unbelievable decision that would infect the entire human race forever to eat the fruit from that, from that forbidden tree. Now let me tell you something. Eve... She deserves a little sympathy on our part. Eve never had a mother that she could go to when her husband was being a knothead and say, Mom, what do I do now? Eve never had a mother when, when the babies came along to go and say, Mom, what do I do? The baby's just crying all night. I don't know what to do. I can't get him to stop. Eve never had a mother to go get advice from. And, and when the baby had a fever, when the baby was teething or whole, oh, when the baby had the colic, Eve had to figure it all out on her own. Eve was the first mother to experience heartache. First one to make bad decisions. First one to sometimes feel like I'm having to learn it all on my own first one to experience heartaches. You see, two of her sons, Cain and Abel, they were involved in the first murder. One was the victim, one was the murderer. She was the first mother to experience burying a child. Now, in spite of these failures, and you would think, man, Eve was... This perfect lady, she didn't make this bad decision in eating of that forbidden fruit, but I mean, still, she, she uh, was raising this family, and yet she raised one of them that became a murderer. Had to bury one son, but in spite of all these failures, I want you to realize something. God never got rid of Eve. In Genesis 3.15, we see that though she had made these bad decisions and she had uh, experienced, I'm sure, some failures, God said this, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. God gives a, a promise in regards to Eve and he's telling that serpent, he's saying, listen, her seed, talking about the Christ that would come years later, it is through her seed that I'm going to bless this earth. The first messianic pro promise and it regarded her seed. God, in spite of her foolish decision and in that act of rebellion, outright rebellion, I'm going to eat of this fruit that God himself told me not to eat of. And yet when that happened, God covered her shame. Verse 21, it says, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins, and he clothed so here we see Eve, she, I mean, man, she's make, made these bad decisions in spite of living in a perfect environment. Listen, before they ate of that fruit, Eve had the perfect husband. Can you imagine that? He probably met every need Eve had. He loved her more than any other woman in the world. She was the only one there. Had no competition. She didn't have to outdo the other one to keep his attention. She had a perfect husband. He was probably the perfect specimen of physical health. He was probably, I mean, much like you and I, Brother Jesse. Amen. He was the, the perfect intellect. Had the, uh, there was a perfect intimacy there, and yet she blew it all. And God doesn't toss her to the side. He gives a promise regarding her future, 
he covered her shame and he gave her more children. Genesis 4.25, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, who came Cain slew. She may have thought, what did I do wrong with Cain that he would, I taught him better than that. I taught him to love his brother. And he killed him. And yet God says, you know what, I'm, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a promise. I'm going to cover your shame, and then I'm going to give you another child. Eve teaches us. Listen, moms. Eve teaches you that even in your imperfection, God's a merciful God. And sometimes you may think, boy, I just, man, I don't know what to do here. And boy, I've made these decisions. Those were bad decisions. Boy, I sure messed this up over here. But listen, I want to tell you, God does not toss you to the side, ma'am. Our God is a merciful God and still has plans for you. Sarah. Look in Genesis chapter 18, verses 12 through 15. Sarah had passed the time of childbearing. She's in her 90s. 90s, ladies. 90s. After there was once that I can remember that after um, after Carson was born that my wife, she, she became a little panicked. She said, well, look, I'm not sure. There's a possibility. She's about to cry. She said, man, I, we, we've had five. And I'm barely sane as it is. And I'm getting a little older now. I mean, now would be they would consider it dangerous. Here's Sarah. She's 90. Now, she had never had any children. She's 90 years old. She had passed the time of childbearing. She knew that God had promised to make Abraham a father of many nations. She assumed that meant that she would be a mother of many nations, but it just wasn't happening. And when it did not look like it was going to happen, she took matters into her own hands. She gave her maidservant Hagar. She said, listen, here's Hagar. Uh, uh, God said you're going to have a, uh, a son. It's not happening by me, evidently. I'm, I'm getting up in age now. Here, take Hagar. And Abraham did have a son, but that wasn't the one that was promised. And listen in Genesis 18, chapter, uh, verses 12 through 15. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself. The angel had just told Abraham, listen, Sarah is really going to have a baby. It's going to happen in just a year from now. Just next year, she's going to have a baby. And Sarah heard it. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? The time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, How, but nay, but thou didst laugh. To think that God was going to use her now. Look, you promised my, my husband a son. I was sure it was coming through me. It doesn't seem to be happening. Hey, Lord, I'm 90. I'm 90 years old, and he hears the Lord say, hey, I, next year, according to the time of life, I'll come back. Sarah's going to have a child. And she laughed. <laughs> There's no way. I mean, I'm coming, this is, this is not going to happen. And yet, God used a lady that everyone would have considered past the time of being used in such a way. In Genesis 21, 5 through 7, the Bible says, And Abraham was an hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck, for I have borne him a son in his old age? Let me tell you what we learned from Sarah, this mother here, who laughed at God. When God said, 
here's what I'm going to do with Sarah. She said, <laughs> that can't happen. It's just not going to happen. And Sarah, we learn that you are never out of God's will. Listen to me, Mom. Being a mom, being a wife, don't understand it because I've never had that experience, but I get it. I know it's tough. And sometimes you may get, look, my mom to this day, oh, it frustrates me. And if I'm on the phone, yes, I roll my eyes. She says, son, if I've ever done anything to disappoint you, I'm sorry. I've been the best mom I know how to be. I've done the best I could do. And I'll say, Mom, <laughs> sometimes, Mom, what in the world are you talking about? Mom, I've told you, you are a great mom. You've never done anything to disappoint me. Mom, you're the greatest mom that ever could be. I know all, you sacrificed for me and you love me. She, well, honey, I, you know, I, sometimes I just get to thinking, if I've ever let you down, I'll do this. I mean, I'll roll my head and everything. Oh. get it. Sometimes you think, man, how, how could God use me now? Then look, you have them grandbabies. And you know a whole lot more about raising a young one than your children do. You know what I'm saying? They don't think you do. And you're sitting back watching them make stupid mistakes and when you try to give them a little advice mom this is our child well fine mess them up <laughs> and sometimes you might get to thinking man I'm done I don't need me anymore don't you believe that lie I want you to know this, no matter where you are in that spectrum of life as a mom and as a husband, you are never beyond God's reach to work through you. You stay faithful. Turn over if you would to, I didn't put a reference, so let me just think about this. Rebecca. Rebecca and Isaac. She had Jacob and Esau, remember? Jacob was Rebecca's favorite. Esau was the dad's favorite. They were twins. Esau was born just more moments before Jacob was. The dad liked Esau the best because he was the outdoorsman. He was the man's man. The Bible tells us that he was a hairy man. Matter of fact, when Jacob went to deceive his dad to get the blessing and the birthright of Esau, he's, he reckoned in the voice he thought something's different there. Esau, is that really Esau? He said, yes. He said, come close to me. Now, here's how hairy Esau was. Jacob got goat skin and tied it to his hands and to the back of his neck. Goat skin. That's pretty hairy. And he pulls his son close and he rubs the back of his hand and he feels all that hair on the goat skin. I mean, this guy was what we used to call a woolly booger. He pulls him close and he, he puts his hand on the nape of his neck and feels all that hair on the back of his neck. He smells him, and he smells the goat skin, and he smells like the outdoors. Well, that's attractive, isn't it? He said, wow, I mean, he's hairy, and he doesn't smell good. That must be Esau. Jacob, however, was Rebecca's favorite. Rebecca helped Jacob to steal Esau's birthright. He was the oldest. The oldest of two would get two-thirds of the inheritance. He got the double portion. 
she helped him to trick the dad, Isaac, into giving Esau's blessing and birthright. Here's what we see with Rebecca, and listen, ladies, this is very important. She used her maternal power as a tool of manipulation. Now, this one here, rather than encouragement, this is a, a, a word of warning. In doing what she did, she disregarded the order of things and the wishes of her dying husband, and the rift that it caused in that family has lasted up to today. A lot of the problems in the Middle East started right here with this rift. And in Rebecca, we do learn something. And look, moms, I know it's easy. Sometimes you think, well, dad don't know, especially if you have daughters you're dealing with. It. Well, dad don't know. He's just a dumb old man. Maybe he is. But we know some things that you don't know, just like you know some things we don't know. Some girl get dressed and she's getting ready to go out the house and dad will say, hold up. Where are you going? Well, I'm going out with some friends. You're not wearing anything but a couple handkerchiefs, girl. You're going to have to put on some clothes. Well, Dad, this is what everybody's wearing. I'm not concerned about what you're wearing. We're concerned about what you're not wearing, girl. You see, Dad sees things how guys see things. And Mama will come along and say, you leave my baby alone. She is just fine. No daughter of mine's going out dressed like that. She, well, come on, honey. I'll help you find something else. And they go upstairs and say, now you leave that on. Let's put these clothes on over those clothes. And when you get out and daddy can't see you, then you can take these clothes off and just wear this because I think it's fine. Let me tell you something, man. You are making a huge mistake bigger than you'd ever realize here by being a manipulator in the home. Now, ladies, listen, just like Eve, just like Sarah, God can still use you. You can make it a mess. In Rebecca, we, she reminds us that manipulation is a dangerous thing. And boy, listen, I see that in a lot of homes. When dad's home, things are one way. But when dad's not home and mama's there, it's a totally different life. God never meant for that to be. You and that husband are still one flesh, and you're to operate as a team. But these are my babies. Let me tell you something you're not going to like here, okay? Let me tell you something you're not going to like. God gave you that husband before he gave you those babies. And the best thing you could do for them babies is love their daddy. Best thing you can do, love God and love their daddy. Does anybody out there believe that? Okay, well, thank you. I'm feeling lonely up here. Here's the next one. Bathsheba. <laughs> Shanda just went, uh, that old hussy. <laughs> Turn to Second Samuel chapter 12. Thank you, Shanda. We needed that. You know the story of her and, and David, the affair they had? Then David had Uriah, her husband, killed to cover it up. David then is confronted by the prophet Nathan, and he said, You're the man, David. David repents with bitter tears. And the baby that had been conceived between them two, God took. Now, Bathsheba's reaction is never, to, to all that's going on, it's never recorded. However, her sin is well recorded her and David as a matter of fact with David the Bible will say many times how he's a man after God's heart and how he sought after the Lord continually but every once in a while it throws in 
except for that matter with who? Bathsheba. We all know her name. We all know it well enough that some ladies will say, uh, when they hear it. She's not one that we hold up as, yeah, hey, honey, when you grow up to be a lady, be one like Bathsheba. Her sin is well recorded. And even though she was the king's new wife after her husband was killed, King David married her, and she was known as the king's new wife, she would also be known for her past sin. She would always remember the son that was lost because of her sin. And that sin would never be able to be wiped from her memory. It would never be wiped from public memory. As a matter of fact, here we are some thousands of years later, and we still know what Bathsheba did. And she would have to live the rest of her life with those regrets. Look in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her. And she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him, loved Solomon. Solomon, here Bathsheba, she, she partook in this this awful sin, now she's going to be known for this awful sin the rest of her life. Posterity is going to re, uh, uh, know her as uh, uh, the lady that committed adultery. And yet God gave her a son that God said, I love that boy right there. Solomon turned out to be a peaceful leader whose wisdom was sought out by leaders of nations all over the world. He led Israel to greater heights than had they had ever known. Never had Israel prospered as it did under his rule. All this from the, the son of a woman whose past was marred. All this from the son of a woman who for out, throughout history would be known for her sin and now, even though she had used such indiscretion, now God has blessed her in such a way that she sits back and she takes such joy and delight in how God is blessing her son. Let me tell you what we learn in Bathsheba. That no matter your past, Mom, no matter the circumstances surrounding your pregnancy or anything else in your past or in your present, no matter the dysfunction of your family, God can still redeem any situation. You say, well, look, my children are out. They have families of their own. But I look and some of the things I did, some of the decisions I made, and some of the things I taught, I, I see them in my family and I, I see the mistakes the, being carried on. And, and preacher, well, I, I don't know what to do. Listen, our God is a God that transcends time and space. And our God is a powerful God. And our God can redeem any situation. I came from a broken home. My mom will say once in a while, honey, I'm sorry that happened. I'm sorry things worked out the way they did. And once again, I'll say, mom, what's done is done. And God redeemed that situation. And the things I know in life now, some of us, because of what happened then, God's used all that. He, look, Mom, don't be sorry. It's, it's the past, and God's already worked things out, Mama. You don't have to carry around that guilt. You do not have to be identified by your past. If you are a child of God, you are identified as being a child of God. Your identity is not your past. Your identity is is in Jesus Christ. So you lift your head up. Jochebed. 
What a name. Don't you wish your mom would have called you that? Exodus chapter 2. Jochebed, what a story we have here. Lived in Egypt. Pharaoh had made a decree. All the male babies are to be killed. He told the midwives, look, as right before they're born, or, or right after, you strangle them, you kill them, you find some way to kill this baby. The midwives and, his, and, and, and Jochebed, they exercise civil disobedience in order for a child named Moses to be born. Say, I'm not killing this baby. The midwives, they, they would not kill those male babies. And, and Pharaoh said, hey, what are you doing? They said, hey, listen, these Hebrew ladies, they're liable. By the time we get there, they've already given birth. It's too late. She keeps Moses hid as long as possible, her and her husband. When they realize, man, there's nothing more. He's going to be found out they're going to kill him. She commits him to God. She sets him adrift on, on, a, on a river in a tiny ark that she made. She has Moses' sister to follow along on the shore to seem rescued by Pharaoh's daughter who then works it out for Jochebed, the mom, to come nurse Moses and raise him in Pharaoh's house. Exodus chapter 2, verses 7 through 11, then said his sister uh, to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the women took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses and said, Because I drew him out of the water. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he espied an Egyptian smiting in Hebrew, one of his brethren. He was brought up in the house of Pharaoh, but he knew he was a Hebrew. He knew who he was. He knew who his God was. In Jochebed, we see that faithfulness and determination and ingenuity will lead to great blessings, even in the middle of insurmountable circumstances. Say, oh, I have this troubled child. I don't know that I, well, I don't have a clue what to do. And oh, we're having this kind of trouble in our home. And we're, this is going on in our home. And oh, these, these circumstances and, and these hurdles, they seem too big. We'll never get over them. Hey, in Jochebed, we learn this, Mom. Listen closely now. You be faithful. And God will bless. It may not be in your time. My uncle, one of my uncles, man, he was one bad dude. Grew up in Charlotte, and he was fairly well known in Charlotte for being a fighter. The closest school he'd go to at one time, I think, was in South Carolina. He'd been kicked out of all the others. In middle school, he, he picked a kid up over his head and threw him out the second-story window. That was one of the mild things he did. Bad news. I'm sure my grandmother and my grandfather, hey, look, they spent so much money trying to help this boy. He just keep getting back into trouble. Love the father. Living a raucous lifestyle. It was when he was in his maybe 50s or 60s, I think in his 50s, that the faithful prayers of his mama paid off. He trusted Christ as his Savior. He became a student and a preacher of the Word of God. Hey, boy, that, that godly mama, when he was out on the town and doing things he shouldn't, and she couldn't control him, man, she was at home on her knees begging God to do something in her son. And it seemed like it would never happen because of her faithfulness and determination. God brought a blessing. Here's the last one. Mary. Mary, the mother of Christ. She's told 
she's going to have a baby. She becomes concerned. Why would she have any concerns? Well, listen, unwed pregnancies were severely frowned upon in this day. Sometimes they could result in even being stoned to death. But she was assured that this baby would be a divine gift. However, with gifts always come responsibilities. The changing of diapers, the teaching of the child to walk and talk, the teaching of the child uh, the ways of their people and of God. And, and man, this young lady here, this teenage girl is told, you're going to have a baby. It's going to be the child of God. There's times we see Mary as a mother, listen to this, and, and uh, Luke 2, 48, they were looking for him when he was lost, and when they saw him, they were amazed. They went back several days he had been lost, went back to the temple and found him, and when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. I mean, they're looking for him with a heavy heart. In John 2, 2 through 5, we see him at the wedding. The wine had run out. And Mary says, hey, Jesus, they're out of wine. Can we help out here? She said, what have I to do with you, woman? My hour's not yet come. She's like, yeah, right. She goes to the service and says, hey, hey, we're out of wine. Go over there to Jesus and do what he says. We see her being a mom. A real mom just like you. We see her at the crucifixion. When almost everybody else had turned and walked away, his mama was still there. Years of excitement and joy are now being followed by intense heartache that his mama is still there. Nobody else would be there. Mama's there. And then Mary, we learn this, through it all, mamas are always there, aren't they? Let me conclude this thing here. Mother's love, it's sincere. It's stubborn. Sometimes it, it's seen and doing wrong things, but the heart was in the right place. Sometimes wrong-headed and sometimes riddled with mistakes and imperfections, Mom. I get it. You love those children more than life, right? You say, well, I don't know. I, I'm not a mom. Uh, listen, you have one. Those moms, they love more than life, but they're, and they, they have all the right intentions, but they're, they're riddled with faults and mistakes. None of them and none of you can be perfectly the Proverbs 31 woman. Yet when yielded to God, I want you to remember these things, Mom. In spite of your imperfections and mistakes, you have a merciful God. He has a plan for your life and your home. And however bad it may be, your God can redeem any situation for His purposes. And you're never out of God's reach. And He's always faithful, Mom. So I want to encourage you today, wherever you're at as a mom, as a husband, you hang in there. You be faithful to God and in pursuing God and building a relationship with God. Because even when you think, my children don't need me any longer, and they're just not listening to me, and they don't understand, listen, they're getting it. You just don't realize it. Hang in there, Mom. Thank you for all you do. Happy Mother's Day. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We desperately, desperately need you.